Hello and welcome back, whiteboard doctors. That was me muting my computer. You all are welcome. Um, thank you for those who are returning, who are subscribed, who have seen other videos. I appreciate you watching them. Please leave your comments, concerns, questions. Hit the bell for more notifications. For those who are here the first time, welcome for the first time. We're a free open access medical education uh, YouTube channel, uh, hoping to learn with and from you all. Uh, today we'll be talking about leiomyomas, more commonly known as fibroids. Um, this is another subset video off of the general introductory video of abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, I will link it in the top right corner. It's probably worthwhile to check that out before you see this one, um, as we are kind of going through the differential diagnosis known by the mnemonic Palm Cohen. Uh, the P was endometrial polyps. I can link that in the top right corner. Um, the A was adenomyosis. I can link that in the top right corner. And then the L now of Palm is leiomyoma, also known as fibroids. So fibroids. I um, wanted to first start with just epidemiology, as I tend to do. I'm going to make this smaller epidemiology um, for fibroids. Good. So for fibroids, it's the most common indication for surgery for women in the U.S. Um, it's about for a third of all hysterectomies are performed for this reason. Uh, the lifetime risk in Caucasians is 70% in Caucasians over their lifetime. Um, and the reason I'm emphasizing lifetime is actually because for African Americans, it's a greater than 80% incidence um, by the age of 50 alone. So African Americans are more prone to get lymphomas or fibroids, um, but Caucasians are also very prone to get them as well. So what are fibroids? So the pathogenesis. Pathogenesis of fibroids, these are uh, benign, hence myoma, uh, benign uh, proliferation of smooth muscle. So benign prolif of smooth muscle cells within the myometrium. They are hormonally responsive, so they have estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors, and they are responsive hormonally, which is important when we talk about treatments for them. Um, as they enlarge, they actually can outgrow the blood supply and this is important because once they outgrow the blood supply, they can actually infarct, they can degenerate, and these kinds of things cause degenerate. No, you're not a degenerate, they degenerate. Um, these can all cause pain, which is why this is important. So they are benign. Enlargement of smooth muscle cells in the myometrium, they're hormonally responsive, um, but once they start to outgrow the blood supply, they can fart degenerate and all that can cause pain. Good. Um, classifying them, I included this picture from the ob Blueprints book to the right rather than be drawn. I mean, you've all seen my drawing. Um, it is really good in my drawings overall, um, but... I thought including a picture might be actually more helpful this time. Oh, I did just want to say this picture in the top right corner um, just shows um, what these look like. They are uh, benign, smooth muscle gro growths. They're often circular, but not always. And that's what this picture in the top right corner. This is a, a excised leiomyoma. Good. So classification. So these can be submucosal. Um, which means they're deep to the endometrium. Uh, if we look here, this is submucosal. Um, so they're deep to the endometrium, but they're right on top of the myometrium. Um, and these ones often have heavy bleeding, right? Uh, the reason being is because they're so close to the endometrium. They're just directly deep to it. Good. They can be intramural, which means they're in the myometrium themselves. Um, these are most common. And they can still cause bleeding and pain, um, but not as often as submucosal, because submucosal are still close to the endometrium, while intramural are just in the myometrium. They can be subserosal. Um, and this is actually deep to the uh, uterine serosa, right? So we have our 
endometrium here, or myometrium here, or serosa here, and these are deep to the serosa. And then they can be, um, so those are like uh, um, some of the general classifications of location, and then other things, they can be pedunculated. To be pedunculated, though, they can't be intramural. Um, they have to be either submucosal or subserosal, right? Um, the reason being is you can't have a, you know, a pedunculated, let's see, is there a submucosal? Yeah, um, a pedunculated intramural, because there's nothing to pedunculate, but you can have a subserosal, or you can have a submucosal pedunculated lyomyoma. Um, it can actually also then become what they call parasitic. Um, and what happens there is that a pedunculated uh, lyomyoma can actually attach to pelvic viscera uh, or omentum and develop its own blood supply, right? So it attaches to omentum, viscera, at which point it gets its own blood supply. And to do that, they have to be pedunculated subserosal because they have to get out to something to get blood supply. So those are all the different locations and how you classify lyomyomas. Um, now let's do risk factors. So let's scroll down here and we'll do some risk factors. Um, risk factors are more important in lyomyomas than they are in kind of endometrial polyps and adenomyosis um, because uh, there's a lot of risk factors and protective factors. Um, so one of the risk factors, as we talked about in epidemiology, is being African-American. Um, so African-Americans, their incidence by the age of 50 years old is more than 80%, which you can see here. So one of the risk factors is being African-American. Interestingly, non-smoking is a risk factor. Now, nobody should smoke. I want to make that very clear. Nobody should smoke uh, to protect against lyomyomas, but non-smoking is a risk factor. Um, early menarche, um, right? So these patients who go through menarche at an early age are at increased risk. No parity, so never having children makes you at an increased risk. Being perimenopausal, so being right around the age of where you're going to undergo menopause, Alcohol use, and then hypertension are all risk factors. All right, and then what are protective factors? There are a few important ones, and they kind of get into treatment things as well. Um, oral contraceptive pills are a protective factor. Increasing parity, so getting pregnant more often. Um, is a protective factor. And then injectable depot. So some people have depots, depot medroxy, uh, medroxy progesterone is protective against uh, lyomyomas. Um, so that just helps you with risk stratification of patients with certain complaints um, when you're concerned for lyomyomas. Um, it's also helpful, you know, some things are uh, changeable, you know, OCPs and depot medroxy progesterone. Um, so those things can be helpful in the management as well. And I'll get into all that in a little bit. So how do these patients clinically present? So the clinical presentation, as with, you know, almost every disease is variable, but there are certain patterns, right, to be aware of. So most common, I think you've seen this with a lot of these uh, diagnoses, if you've watched the other videos, um, in terms of diagnoses for abnormal uterine bleeding, most common, they're actually asymptomatic. So you saw that for endometrial polyps, you saw that for adenomyosis, um, but those who aren't often get menorrhagia, which is heavy uterine bleeding, Metro Raja, which is bleeding in between your periods, or some combo of the two. And I talk about all those definitions in the abnormal uterine bleeding video that I linked to earlier. Um, you also can get pressure symptoms, right? If you have a mass growing in your uterus, you can get pressure symptoms. Um, this can cause constipation, right? If you have pressure on the bowels, it can actually cause hydronephrosis if it obstructs the ureters. 
and it can cause venous stasis if it's pressing on the IVC. So think about pressure symptoms, right? Pressures on the bowels, you get constipation. Presses on the ureters, you get hydronephrosis. Pressures on, pressures, presses on the inferior vena cava, the IVC, you can get venous stasis. Um, and then as with all these, you saw this with endometrial polyps, you saw this with adenomyosis, you get iron deficiency, which gives you anemia, which means you can have systemic symptoms of anemia. Anemia, that's an M, we'll make the I there, such as generalized weakness, orthostasis, dizziness, fatigue, all that kind of stuff. All right, good. So mostly asymptomatic, but menorrhagia, metorrhagia, which is heavy periods and bleeding in between periods. So you can pressure symptoms if they're very large and iron deficiency anemia. So then how do we diagnose these? Um, for this, let's carry over. I'm gonna bring another picture over. All right, so diagnosis, we'll right over here. And then we'll go over by that picture. So diagnosing leiomyomas. Um, the go-to, like a lot of these, both with endometrial polyps and adenomyosis, is transvaginal ultrasound. Um, what you're looking at are hypoechoic. Remember, that's dark areas, hypoechoic, um, within normal myometrial tissue, within normal myometrial tissue. So let's see what we can find here. So in this picture we have, I'll outline it, this is the uterus here. This is a normal myometrium, right? You see this mixed echoic. It's darker than the endometrial stripe which is here. Um, and then you have this hypoechoic mass on the outside of the myometrium. Now let me take off my lines to make it easier to see. All right, so this here, I'll outline it. This is hypoechoic. It's darker um, than the myometrium, which is this lighter mixed echoic area, and it kind of comes off, right? Here's the myometrium, then this comes off, and it goes back down. So it's that hypoechoic area bulging off the normal myometrium. That is a leiomyoma or a fibroid. All right. Um, other things you can do, you can... Uh, do a his, uh, uh, hysteroscopy, which we talked about with the other ones, um, where you take a camera, you go up through the cervix, the vagina into the uterus, hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy, I think that's right. Um, you do a hysteroscopy to visualize submucosal. You do a hysterosalpingogram, right, hysterosalpingo. Gram, which is another way to visualize the tissues. And you do a saline infusion sonogram. Um, I will say, again, I'm not an ob guide doctor, um, but I've seen transvaginal ultrasounds, I've seen hysteroscopy, I've seen hysterosalpingogram, I've never seen a saline sonogram. All right, so primarily diagnosis is going to be transvaginal ultrasound, and this is what you're going to be seeing, that hypoechoic mass coming off the myometrium, which is kind of a mixed echoic uh, area. Good. And then last is treatment. All right, so how do you treat it? We've now found a patient with it. We've diagnosed it. Uh, most of them just require monitoring every six months. Oh, what was that? Monitoring Q6 months. All right. They mostly do not require medications or anything like that, and this is obviously primarily for asymptomatic ones or minimally symptomatic ones. Now, if a patient is symptomatic, and what's that defined as? It could be pain, it can be bleeding, it can be those pressure symptoms, right? Constipation, hydronephrosis, venous stasis or infertility as well, patients who are having trouble getting pregnant, there's uh, several different options. So one is going to be hormone treatment. And for hormone treatment, you could do OCPs, you could do progestins. Um, progestins are like uh, uh, medrox, uh, medroxy, uh, ciprogesterone, 
a marina IUD, a norethadrone acetate, those types of things. Um, you can do mithopristone. You can do androgenic steroids. Androgenic steroids. Androgenic steroids are like a denazole, gestrinone, those. I'm going to make this a little thinner. It'll be easier to write. Um, also, you can do GNRH agonist. GNRH agonist. Agonist. Good. And these are like luprolide, uh, dosarelin, uh, nafarelin, and all these will shrink fibroids by decreasing circulating levels of estrogen. Okay, some other things. Uh, I haven't seen this really utilized, but you can do a uterine artery embolism. Embolization. So this is where you go in uh, the um, femoral artery with a catheter and you embolize the uterine artery, cutting off blood supply to the fibroids themselves. Um, you can do an MRI-guided thermoablation. So you use an MRI to find the fibroid. And then you use um, sound waves to thermoablate the fibroid. Um, and then I'm going to do this in a different color because these are kind of uh, things that you often will see and read about um, are surgical things. So you can do a myomectomy. Myomectomy is where you go in and you just excise the fibroid itself. Right. And then you can do a full hysterectomy. So patients who have failed other treatment are extremely symptomatic or um, they just, you know, don't have, uh, don't want to have children or anything and are okay with having their uterus removed. Um, they can have a hysterectomy where they remove the whole uterus and that's the definitive treatment um, as it is with many of these things. So treatment, uh, if they're asymptomatic, you just monitor. If they're symptomatic, you can try hormones initially um, and then after that, it's mostly surgical. I haven't really seen this uterine artery embolism room where I got thermal ablation much, although not to say it doesn't happen. Good. So that is leiomyomas or fibroids. Um, I will scroll through. So we did treatment, we did diagnosing, primarily transvaginal ultrasound, uh, clinical presentations for them, uh, risk factors, protective factors, uh, classifications, pathogenesis, and epidemiology. Uh, thank you for viewing. Appreciate your time. Leave your comments, questions, concerns below. Uh, subscribe, hit the bell, whatever you all like to do. I uh, appreciate it, and you all have a good afternoon or whatever time it is by you all.